Walker, plus guidance and encouragement along the way. MP Dodge has a unique mentoring program for new agents. It's helped jumpstart my career and has a supportive management team and administrative staff. So if you're contemplating a career in real estate, look no further than MP Dodge. It will be the best decision you make. This is Lincoln's home for sports talk on the FM dial. Also online at theticketfm.com. On the internet. KNTK FM Firth, 93.7 The Ticket. So I switched my insurance to State Farm and get this. I talked to an actual State Farm agent who lives in my actual town. And get this. My actual agent in my actual town gave me actual help with the coverage I needed. And get this. My actual agent in my actual town who gave me actual help actually knows my name. And get this. They actually say it's called service. Call your local State Farm agent, Vinny Krikak, at 402-474-1173. Is your backyard ready for fun with friends and family this fall? GE Landscape Supply has pavers and boulders, which are a great accent for any landscaping project. And you can find them at 6701 Cornusker Highway. GE Landscape Supply sells to homeowners and contractors with a vast selection of landscaping and construction materials. And don't forget... They deliver anywhere, nearby or far away. Stop by at 6701 Cornusker Highway from 7 a.m. to 5 p.m. Monday to Friday. Go to GELandscapesupply.com for more info or call 402-467-1627. It's football season in Nebraska, and that means coaches are busy making game plans. I'm Eric Hagan with Liberty Law Group. Teams make game plans because no two opponents are the same. At Liberty Law, we understand no two cases are the same. Whether facing a DUI, criminal charge, or you were injured and it wasn't your fault, we tailor our legal game plan to meet your unique needs. Liberty Law's relentless trial attorneys serve all of Nebraska. To learn more, visit LibertyLawNebraska.com. That's LibertyLawNebraska.com. At Jimmy John's, we don't make sandwiches. We make the sandwich of sandwiches. We use fresh veggies because we don't hate salads. We just feel bad for them. We make our sandwiches exactly how you want because you're the one who's eating it. And we bake bread all day, every day, because stale bread isn't bread. It's croutons. Sandwich history is written by the victors. Good thing we have legible handwriting. Jimmy John's, the sandwich of sandwiches. Order pickup or delivery on the app. Introducing the Planet Fitness Guide to getting that post-workout glow. Step one, what's your why? More epic energy? Better sleep? Blow off steam? Step two, join Planet Fitness for just $10 a month and get moving. Go cardio crazy in our clean and spacious clubs or get down with some dumbbells and strength equipment. Step three, bask in that post-workout glow. Join Planet Fitness today for just $10 a month. It's glow time. See club for details. Belmont Chiropractic and Novotny Nutrition and Wellness specialize in getting rid of people's pain quickly and permanently. For 31 years, they've been extremely successful with advanced techniques and pain relief using spinal adjustments and decompression, detoxification, diet and lifestyle modification, and more. They are fully equipped to handle the most seasonal athlete, weekend warrior, car accidents, strains, sprains, and more. Is there anywhere you're experiencing pain on your body or are you fighting decreased energy and depression? Consult Belmont Chiropractic and Novotny Nutrition and Wellness first at 402-476-8619. Tune in to 93.7 The Ticket as soon as the clock hits zero for the Jay Foreman Postgame Show. Listen to expert analysis from the Husker Hall of Famer, an eight-year NFL veteran for 90 minutes after the game. The Jay Foreman Postgame Show, sponsored by Tanner's Bar and Grill, Vinny Krikak, and Action Plumbing, Heating, AC, and Electrical on 93.7 The Ticket and theticketfm.com. Early break with Sip and Jake. In my opinion, Nebraska is still in the driver's seat Wow, to win this thing. They're in the driver's seat. That would be incredible. If Wisconsin hadn't a lost uh, it's Braylon and a high ankle sprain, you don't play again that year. I mean, they're, it, losing him is monumental. It would be interesting to see a team that's missed so many bowl games in a row, to how, how they could handle potentially having the mentality of being in the driver's seat. Early break with Sip and Jake from 6 to 8 every weekday morning on 93.7 The Ticket. Live from the heart of Lincoln, America, welcome to Ticket Weeknights on 93.7 The Ticket and theticketfm.com. Hey, what's going on, guys? We're back here live at the Nico Project, live every single Sunday from 1 to 2 p.m. 
And so today I like to break down what it means to run a 47 second 400 meter run. So in the sport of track and field, you know, at the division one level, the range from, you know, 44 to 47 seconds would be considered elite. And this was a mark I've been chasing for a very long time now. In high school, I got recruited with only, you know, running 48s, 49s. But to get to that 47 mark was a really, you know, monumental moment for me. And so I finally hit it last year during my sophomore season during a four by four split. And so in the four by four, it's automated timing and colleagues. So you're able to see the breakdown exact splits between 200 meter marks. And so my exact mark, the first time I ever did it, I believe it was like 23 low and then like 24 low as well, which made it around 47.7 seconds. And so last year when I broke this mark, I made a whole entire YouTube video about it, breaking down, you know, what it took to get there, my training. Uh, I even put, you know, some, you know, scientific stuff behind it too, like the anaerobic and aerobic systems and what it really took. So I'm going to play this YouTube video that I made for you guys. It's about 19 minutes long. And then after that, I'm going to go ahead and break it down to you guys, you know, what, what my view on it now looking back at it, because this was during my last season and I've developed a little bit more as an athlete now. So go ahead and watch this video, guys, for now. And then afterwards, we're going to reconnect. You want to run a 47 in the 400? Then you can't get the right pace, man. Oh, yeah. And by the way, all those people that are hating on me, playing at my downfall, man. What's up? All right. My name is Nico Schultz. I'm a 400 meter runner here in Nebraska, 800 meter runner and 600 meter runner. And today I'm gonna to be going over my four x four that I just here recently ran. It was my first time ever going 47 seconds. You can do it too, because listen, when I was in high school, I was not him, bro. I was out there running 51s, 52s, 53s. I barely broke 50 a few times in high school. I've only done it a handful of times. And I kind of feel like I'm on the path to figuring out how to really do this thing, man. So I did it for the very first time here at this track meet. And we're gonna go ahead and dissect this video, man. So go ahead, drop a little comment, say what's up. Um, if you're new to the channel, if you're new to the channel, go ahead and subscribe, man. But yeah, let's go ahead and jump right into this thing, dude. Step number one, your race strategy. It is absolutely dire and a necessity coming with a race strategy. Most of my best races, I've sat down beforehand and I've always planned them out. Always thought to myself, all right, where do I want to be? What's my plan of attack? What's my plan coming in? Who's my competition? Where am I going to be? Everything that you do and all the energy you put into it mentally is going to translate there on the track. So what I always like to do before every single race, I always journal out where I want to have my attack points, acceleration zones, how I want to push, and I'm always addressing my flow phases. So as you can see here in this video, I get the handoff probably about 10, you know, 10 meters back, not, not, not too crazy. Um, so I take the baton here, and as soon as I, as soon as I get the baton, instantly accelerating. In the 400, a lot of people are, are afraid to die. They're afraid that if they get out too fast, they're gonna die out. And that uh, potentially could be true if you go out too fast, let's say the first 200 meters, the first 250 meters. There's this thing called free energy that each and every single one of you people have, each and every single track runner, person, anybody in general, it's basically like your flight or flight response whenever, let's say, a bear is chasing you, right? You have this first seven seconds, they say. The first seven seconds, I like to do the first 30 meters or so. The first seven seconds of your race is free energy. You can run as fast as you possibly can without any harm being done to you at the end of this 400 meter race. So what I always like to do, I like to get out very, very hard as if, as if it's a 50, a 60, or 100 meter run. For the first you know 30 meters i'm here i'm running as fast as i can boom 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 as you can see in this video right here i'll go ahead and rewind it back as you can see i take the baton bam in my first you know 30 meters i'm getting out i'm chasing this dude down as if it's 100 meters right and as soon as uh, my energy reserve is done for those first seven seconds you got to go what i call the float phase all right so float fa floating it's not sprinting and it's not jogging it's this in between peacefulness to where you're just kind of in this zone to where you're, you're, you're focusing on each step and you're just pushing through and controlling your breathing. You're not wasting any energy here. You're literally just riding off the momentum that you use for those first 30 meters or those first seven seconds of your race. So if you can kind of see here as you go into the video, this is all just floating. Now granted, this is a very good runner ahead of me. He split about a 49 flat. My split was a 47.7 and I was fortunate to catch him at the end. But the only reason I caught this guy at the end was because I planned out my race better than he did. Granted, it is very hard in order to lead a race all the way from start to finish and not have to worry about the guy behind you getting caught. But it is twice as hard to catch a guy who already had a, a second and a half to a two second lead ahead of you. So I'm going to show you guys how to get in the same position. So as you can see, let's go ahead and rewind this back a little bit. So I take the baton right here, right? Like I told you, first seven or 30, 30 meters getting out getting out getting out and then bam i'm entering the float phase float 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 i'm feeling good feeling good now 
not all of you are, are ever going to run on a, a bank curve. I hope all of you do, but some of you do not have that luxury. Um, but rather, rather it's, it's um, inverted, rather it's flat. You have to always excel and push into a curve because you can't run a curve like how you run a straightaway. You have to be able to kind of adjust yourself even so for, my, for me for example this nebraska it's an elevated track so what i like to do i like to push into the curve and kind of lean my body in so as i'm running in i'm kind of gaining momentum but at the same time i'm like i'm pushing up and i'm pushing down so that i'm building up building up and when i get to the top i'm kind of just in this relaxation and i'm pushing back down i'm using my momentum to slingshot me off the curve in order to use that to my advantage if you just run the curve like a normal straightaway you're going to be fighting against momentum and fighting against yourself and wasting too much energy you have to fight into that curve and fight down and shoot yourself down in order to slingshot and get across so here i am i'm pushing against the curve here i'm pushing i'm pushing i'm pushing i'm pushing and i'm pushing back down and as you can see here this is what i like to call my first acceleration zone of the race so there's two acceleration zones it's about right when you're coming in through that first 150. So it's like between that 150 and 200 meter mark. And then there's another zone coming up between, I believe, what is that technically? The two, the last 150 meters of your race. So I think that's what, 250. There's uh, an acceleration zone here at 150 and an acceleration zone at 250. I like to do this because there's only 400 meters in the race, right? The first 30 are you getting out using that free energy. The, the kind of middle part of that is the float phase, as I, as I mentioned before. And then this right here is really where you have to make a move. So I'm at, coming off the momentum off the curb. You're slingshotting, right? You have to basically call this your acceleration zone. You have to get up. You have to get up right and really push into the ground. I wouldn't say you're draining your energy, but you're going, you're not floating. You got to push into the ground. You got, Whatever you give, put in, this is everything that's holds true in life and racing as well. Whatever you put in is exactly what you get out. Each step you take in a 400 is detrimental to your success because you're not going to get that step back. So rather that step is lazy or it's powerful and you're getting momentum off the ground, it's going to affect your race in a positive or negative way. You have to push into the ground. You have to literally think each step is a powerful stride. Whenever you're practicing your stride, you don't do it lackadaisical. You always are making sure your form's good, you're standing up tall and you're pushing off the ground and your arms are using, you are nothing without your arms. You always are going to need your arms in your race. If you have bad arms, you're going to have bad legs. You never see nobody kind of just running like this. It's impossible. You have to push. You have to use your arms. And if you look here, I'm really digging. I'm really using my arms. Like I'm pushing, I'm pushing. And you can kind of see him. He's kind of leaning side to side with his stride and stuff like that. Like he, he's starting to feel it, right? And me, I'm accelerating. I know this is my excel zone. I have this plan coming in. I knew on this curve, rather he was in front of me, behind me, next to me, that this was gonna be in my excel. That's another race strategy as well. Do not change your race strategy just because of something that's happening within the race. Things might not go to plan. Things might, you know, go faster at the start or faster at the end. Never throw away, throw away your race strategy because of fear or uncertainty. Always hold true to your plan because it's gonna serve you well and it's gonna give you more race experience as well. Stay true to that race strategy. So as you can see here, I'm really pushing. This is my acceleration zone. So bam, after getting to my acceleration zone, what do we say about the curves? You're pushing into the curve. I'm pushing, 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 kind of leaning to the side a little bit, and then I'm pushing back down into my second acceleration zone. Right here, if you can kind of see, I really made up a lot of ground in this back stack. Not a lot of people think that I was gonna, or thought that I was gonna be able to catch this guy, but I was coming off this curve and I have such great stamina coming into this race and a lot of great conditioning, which we're gonna get into later, later into this, that I was able to make a move, make a plan, and he started kind of fizzling out and I was kind of just getting started. So as you can see here, I really ate up a lot of ground. I mean, if you rewind it, let me back to even just the beginning, like, I was not this close to this guy. I mean, he had a respectable lead, you know, against me. He was way up there. And if we fast forwarded to where, kind of where I just was, right about here, like I really made up a lot. Just off of the first, you know, 250 meters of the race. Um, and now we're approaching the last 150. So as I said, you're excelling here. And guys, this is gonna hurt. This part of the race sucks. My lungs still hurt. My rib cage area still hurts from literally this race because of how hard I went and because like, like it wasn't killer. Like I wasn't on the ground after, but like I've never experienced that type of speed before. You know, I, in high school, I was always a 49, 50, 51 guy. Um, I split 48 for the last time in December and this was a 47 race. Granted, the adrenaline was high. Um, the stakes were high. You know, I want to be on that starting 4x4 team to re represent Nebraska. So I knew that I had 
to go crazy. I mean, there was a, a guy, a kid on my team named Garrett, shout out him. He went 46 and he's a freshman, 46, seven. So I'm like, man, he just went 46. I'm not gonna, I can't let, let, the, let him lose this race. I gotta show out, I gotta do my thing. And that is why you always gotta put your all into these races, no matter what. The worst, the best results, you gotta give it your all because you do not know when your next race is gonna be. With COVID, I gave it all, man. You know, when COVID hit, I literally treated every race like it was my last after that because you never knew, you never knew what was gonna happen. I don't know if there was never gonna be track again or anything again, you know? So always treat these races like you're like they're the last, each and every single one. Like treat them as smart. Hard work doesn't mean anything if it's not smart. So, sorry, I just went off on a little spiel there. But as I was saying, all holds true at any point with these curves. Push into the curve. I don't care if it's flat. I don't care if it's inverted. Inverted, yes, it's going to be easier to slingshot through, but you have to push into the curves no matter what. You have to use your momentum ride sideways, and you got to have a float phase. So now we're in to, I'll just call this the red zone, dog. Like, you have to make a play here. Coming into these last 100 meters, okay, I'm making them ground, okay? I know I caught up to them. I know I'm here, but time is of the essence. There is not that much room for error and there's not much else that I can really do besides hold my form and outstride and I'll kick this guy, okay? So if you look here, I'm gonna slow it down. You gotta see the difference between our forms, okay? I'm dying, I'm hurting, you know, I use a lot of energy to get to this point, right? But he's hurting even, even more. He doesn't know where I am the whole entire race until now. He feels me next to me, right? And now he's starting to tense up. You can't do this when somebody approaches you, okay? You can't tense up and take too long of strides. You have to stay consistent and stay here. Stay here always. Always revert back to your arms. No matter how in pain you are, you always have to go back to your arms because your arms are gonna propel you forward and your arms are gonna what give you a difference between a 49 and a 47 in this instance. So look at, I'm pushing off the ground, arms, 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 arms. I do have a little bit of a, little bit of a back kick. It's uh, my form, like I said, I'm still working on it. I'm still in the process of doing things. But overall, this entire race, 47-7. I mean, I went from a 48-2 last month to a 47-7 now with hopes of potentially going 46 indoors. So that was the race strategy of this entire race. I'm just gonna have this here playing in the background so you guys can kind of peep. But going into my next phase or my next talking point into what you need in order to, to get to this level, preparation, three types of preparation, your training, eating slash sleeping, and your mental prep. Let's go ahead and start with the training. So for me, as a 400, 800 meter hybrid, you know, I always thought that I needed a lot of mileage. I always thought, man, I need to be putting in 25, 30, 40 mile weeks, right? In order to get to this point, in order to run 47 seconds, in order to run 148, 147. And for me, that's just not the case. And I found that out this past season when right now I'm barely doing 12 miles a week. And uh, I'm just a more speed-based runner. That I was a football player in high school. I always did track and I, I never really ran with the distance guys until like college. And you know, the distance just didn't serve me well. Last season, I got really hurt. It didn't end up working for me. And you know, all the mileage ended up hurting me. All those crazy long 2K, 3K, 5K workouts ended up hurting me. And for me, my training this season, it's been a lot of speed work in the fall. I did a lot of hills, a lot of 200s. I mean, there was points where we were doing 16 200s at two minutes rest at, you know, 30, 29, 28, 27. And I was finishing out the last reps in like 24, 25 seconds. You, I, you need speed and you need a base. In the summertime, when I was lifting, I was lifting four times a week in the summer, just trying to get stronger, trying to build a base for now, for this upcoming season. I was doing hand cleans, squats, hills, um, fart licks, anything that you can really think of in order to get my speed up and my general just conditioning is what you need in order to be successful and in order to get to this point to run this 47 because without that like it's going to be impossible with some people can make it work but when you get to the higher levels when you feel that speed when you feel the speed of going 47 and maybe even 46 45 i mean like you not the mileage is not going to serve you that well you need that speed work all the olympians they go fast they are fast people depending upon the race obviously like the 800 400 there's, there's some 400 meter runners that's never ran over three miles their entire life. It's all just this explosive work, all form work, all power and, and endurance. It takes endurance. And there's a lot of different ways to run the 400. This is just my example. But I have 
great stamina. I have a lot of energy reserved in order to kind of hang. I mean, like, I, I, I'm talking about preparation, race strategy, acceleration zones and stuff like that. And honestly, you can't really see me accelerate. In my mind, I'm telling myself to accelerate, but it's really hard to see because for me, I'm a stamina runner. I'm an 800 meter runner. There's guys that can go 20 point. That guy, for example, that I mentioned, Garrett, who ran second leg for us, he runs 20.6 in the, in the 200. I cannot do that. I probably have a 21.9 at best on, my, on a good day, 21.8. Um, that's just not it for me. But Garrett, he can't run a 116, 115, 600, which is more in my wheelhouse, you know? So, like I said, going back to what I was saying about the weight room and, and, and training and conditioning, you need to run fast. You need to go out there and put in the work. The work, you're not just going to wake up one morning and run 47 unless you're just insanely and talented, gift, talented. Talentedly gifted. Golly. You just can't do it. You've got to put in the work. You've got to have a plan and you've got to have a strategy. And on top of that, two other things going into my next part of this preparation phase is your eating and your sleeping. Guys, it is so important to have good nutrition and good sleep. Sleep, I don't care if you're going and working out eight to nine hours a day. If you don't sleep, all of that was for nothing. You need to get at least seven to nine hours to sleep a night. I still struggle with this personally. I'm a person whose mind is always running. I'm always thinking about content ideas. I'm always thinking about life. But you need to put yourself in a position to be successful with sleeping. It's just how it is. It's how it is as a collegiate athlete. Last season, I was training like a maniac. I was probably training harder then than I was now. But I wasn't sleeping good. The sleep will, will always come back to get you. Sleep helps prevent injuries. It helps improve mental health. There are so many benefits to sleeping. Your body can only improve if you get good sleep. And another thing too, here's just a life tip in general. This is not even just about working out. Always stop eating three hours before bed. Um, if you're gonna go to sleep at 11, stop eating at, at uh, was it eight o'clock? Yeah, stop eating at eight o'clock or 7.30 or really whatever it is. And then wait an hour, at least one hour when you wake up uh, to eat something, to eat anything in general. It just This just helps your body replenish itself faster. Let's say you eat 30 minutes before you go to bed and you go to bed. Your body is going to be digesting that food for the next two hours. And if you wait those three hours, like how I just said, your body is going to be able to just start working on your body instantaneously after you start going into sleep because it doesn't have anything to digest. You might feel a little bit hungry going into bed, but I promise it's going to serve you well. But like I said, going into that food though, eat, 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 and eat, bro. Eat healthy, nutritious foods. What I like to hold myself in a standard to is always five out of the seven days in a week. You want to eat good five out of the seven days in a week because those five solid core days when you're working out, when you're really getting after it, those are going to be so much important rather than the two days. Let's say like you have some crazy dessert. Let's say like you have like a Culver's or something. Or let's say uh, you go out, you get ice cream. Like it's not going to be that bad because the, the majority of the days of eating good outweighs the days of eating bad. So, like I said, give yourself those, the weekend to kind of go crazy, whatever meals you want. Um, like I said, always at least get one or two good meals a day, a solid meal, rather that's chicken, pasta, rice, eggs, really whatever. Um, get one or two solid meals a day, a day on the weekends. Um, and with training, what I realized too, you want to plan your meals accordingly. But before my race, I don't. I think I, I raced at about 5 o'clock. I had Jimmy John's at exactly like 1.15. That gave me like kind of a, I was supposed to race at 4.30, the race got pushed back 30 minutes, but it gave me like a, like this little like three and a half, three to four hour layover so my food could properly digest and I had enough energy to run. There's been times where I would literally only eat oatmeal in the mornings and then have a race at two o'clock and I would die. I could not understand why I was not able to perform to my highest level and I was like, man, what am I doing? What am I doing wrong? What's wrong with me? Like I couldn't figure it out, but it was just because I had, I was lacking nutrition. I was lacking um, energy. I was literally getting, you know, 600 meters into my 800 and I'm just dying. I don't know what happened. This feels like I lost everything. Your body is running through calories, dude. Your body is burning so much to get to this point. Your body doesn't know if you're running from a bear for your life or if you're running to go ahead to impress the females in the stands, bro. Your body is literally just there just throwing stuff out there like, all right, we're going fast, Bur take this, burn it. We're going faster, take this, burn it even more. Wait, what do you mean we only ate, ate oatmeal this morning, dog? What are you talking about? We're gonna die, we have nothing left in our system. And then that's what happens, you catch a crap, you, you, you tense up in your race, you have nothing left. And that's why you feel dizzy, that's why you feel like you wanna puke after. And listen, after this race, you know, I planned everything great. The race strategy was great, the nutrition was great, my head was still spinning, bro. This is the love-hate relationship you gotta have with track and field. You know, and this is why this turns me into my last part of this preparation phase, 
um, is mental preparation though, dude. And it's not even just about the race strategy. This really has to do with about how you're taking care of yourself. A big, you know, thing about me is morality and because how you treat yourself because how you treat yourself is more important than how you treat anything in this life this is the one life you're going to get this is the one body you're going to get and this might be the one chance you have to make something really special and to kind of live on through a legacy for what you're trying to provide here in the track and field world or in, in life in general you know um there's a lot of pressure there's a lot of things that go wrong and you got to be able to, to be your biggest hype man to be your biggest supporter you know um it's just it's so important to take care of yourself your mental health and do whatever makes you happy for me last year i you know i really want to be big on discipline but at the same time i allowed myself to have fun i allowed myself to you know play madden for like like an hour and a half two hours before i go to bed after i had a stressful day of school uh allowed myself to do things that 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 i wanted to do to go on a walk like late at night with music on to 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 scroll tiktok for like 30 to 40 minutes or an hour like like you gotta give yourself leeway you work so hard all day every day always mine's always racing you're expected to perform at such a big level uh you gotta have fun with it you gotta have fun with the process and fun with yourself there's gonna be times where days suck life is hard things are hard but at the end of the day you have to have yourself you have to be able to stay positive and, and and focus and just have a good balance life is nothing without balance always have balance be disciplined have fun and just do the best that you can possibly do trial and which leads me into my last and final phase trial and error as i mentioned before in this video and i always say this i was not always the best runner i it was always a mentality thing for me i always wanted to be the best i always wonder why i wasn't the fastest it takes trial and error guys my senior year i broke the 600 meter state record right faster than i've ever ran before the next week i ran 49.2 in the 400 and this was all indoor and i'm thinking dude i'm gonna run 46 this year i'm 47 i'm gonna go crazy dude i opened up my outdoor season in 51 seconds after going 49 indoors do you know how much of a drop off that is how much of a lack of a progression that is that's degression and my With body was in shock. I didn't, pre I didn't prepare mentally. Already. I didn't prepare physically. I got too big headed. I, I lost self confidence. Mental health was down the drain. Like, like it takes running bad to appreciate running good. And that is so important here in track and field that you have to appreciate and learn from the bad times in order to make it to the good times and in order to improve. Literally, there are so many bad races that I've had in the past that got me to this point to running this 47.7. And I'm super proud of myself and I'm super happy for all the progression that I've made throughout these, these, these past years. I started running track in the seventh grade, dude. And, you know, I was barely breaking 60 seconds in the, se in the seventh grade. Got to high school. Uh, I was barely running 52s and 51s my freshman year, sophomore year. Finally ran 49 in the open. Junior year, COVID, senior year went crazy and then lost it all got to the top and then lost it all freshman year i want to ball out overtrained didn't eat properly didn't know how to balance life didn't know how to balance college got hurt and now here i am after all those years of experience from all the way from 2016 till now till 2023 and still in counting in years you have to fail i i you're gonna fail i need you to fail if you want to be successful you have to fail and it sounds so crazy but i failed miraculously dude i've had races where i was projected to win by landslides and got last like it's how life works and it's what's gonna make you great and it's how i became great and like i said this is what it takes in order to get to this level and i hope this video helped each and every single one of you i hope that you achieve all your dreams and all your goals 47 7 was the split in this race you have what it takes i believe in you we all believe in you let's go Nico shows out of here, baby. Peace. Boom. Introducing the Planet Fitness Guide to getting that post-workout glow. Step one, what's your why? More epic energy? Better sleep? Low off steam? Step two, join Planet Fitness for just $10 a month and get moving. Go cardio crazy in our clean and spacious clubs or get down with some dumbbells and strength equipment. Step three, bask in that post-workout glow. Join Planet Fitness today for just $10 a month. It's glow time. See club for details. Okay, kids, dad's going to teach you how to dance. First, spread your feet apart. 
then uh, pump your knee, uh, nod your head, uh, shake your hips, uh, and bite your lip ever so slightly. <laughs> now, with one hand in the air, point at people with the other hand. I call that the rock star. Dance like a dad. It's a great way to make a moment with your kids. Now, make a face like it just smells something bad. Visit fatherhood.gov. Brought to you by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services and the Ad Council. At Parkview Animal Hospital in Lincoln, it's not just the professional care that sets them apart, but their warm staff and state-of-the-art facilities. Whether it's for a routine checkup or a comprehensive medical procedure, at Parkview, your pet isn't just another number, but a valued member of their caring family. Visit them at pahlincoln.com today and in person just south of 14th and Pine Lake Road. Parkview Animal Hospital, your pet, our passion. For happier, healthier furry friends. Early break with Sip and Jake. In my opinion, Nebraska is still in the driver's seat. Wow. To win this thing. They're in the driver's seat. That would be incredible. If Wisconsin hadn't lost uh, it's Braylon in a high ankle sprain, you don't play again for that year. I mean, they're it, losing him is monumental. It'd be interesting to see a team that's missed so many bowl games in a row, to how, how they could handle potentially having the mentality of being in the driver's seat. Early break with Sip and Jake from 6 to 8 every weekday morning on 93.7 The Ticket. Victor deployed for the first time to Afghanistan in 2003. At four in the morning, my phone rang. They said, I regret to inform you that your husband was wounded in action. Victor sustained a moderate traumatic brain injury. I was doing school full time, and I was also then caring for Victor. One of the most important elements of caregiving is taking care of yourself. I just didn't want to forget that I also had goals and that I also had a life. What I did is I challenged Victor to meet me halfway. There are almost 6 million military and veteran caregivers across the nation. We have our own journey, and we can fulfill that journey at the same time that we are helping our loved one. Visit aarp.org caregiving for a free military veteran's guide to navigate your caregiving journey and better care for your loved one and yourself. Brought to you by AARP and the Ad Council. College football in Lincoln, America. The time has come. Start your game day off right with the A1 Automotive Ticket Tailgate Pregame Show. Join the ticket crew as they bring you all the coverage you need to get you ready for the action. It's the A1 Automotive Ticket Tailgate Pregame Show, powered by Sunbelt Rentals. Ben Bleicher with Professional Realty Group of BHHS Ambassador. Select Plumbing, Jimmy Johns, Lincoln Wall-to-Wall Wine and Spirits, Fleet Beef, Buer's Cheese Spread, on 93.7 The Ticket and theticketfm.com. Hey, it's me, your cell phone. We need to talk about something, something serious. I know you love me. I know you like using me wherever you are, but I feel like this isn't working out when you're driving. I know you may think that it's possible to focus both on me and the road, but I just don't feel the same way. I think we should spend time away from each other when you're driving. It's for the best. Visit StopTextStopRex.org, a message brought to you by the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, Project Yellow Light, and the Ad Council. Finally, a good reason to have a smart house. Just say, Alexa, play 93.7 The Ticket, and we'll magically start playing. How's it work? Nobody knows. Don't ask questions. Sometimes I just cannot believe all the storms we've gone through here. I can only hope that we'll be able to leave this house to you one day, baby. You're our legacy. Planning for these disasters will make sure we're safe. And is the best way to protect that legacy. Protect your legacy. Visit ready.gov forward slash plan for the tools and tips you need to start your emergency preparedness plan today. Brought to you by FEMA and the Ad Council. There's no better way to spark a child's imagination than to get lost in the adventure of a good book. I'm Jenny Benson, president of NSEA. Working together, parents and teachers can help every child succeed. You can help by reading to your child and let your child read to you. Encourage reading in your home and make it a priority. Make reading fun and a time that you and your child look forward to spending together. Sponsored by the Nebraska State Education Association, aired by the Nebraska Broadcasters Association and the station. Back to the Ticket Weeknights on 93.7 The Ticket and theticketfm.com.
All right, guys, welcome back. So that right there was the how to run a 47 second there in the 400 meter run. And so looking back at that video, there were a lot of things that I still agree on. And there were some things that you know I've developed over time uh, when it came to communicating with more coaches, when it came to finishing up my sophomore season and just, you know, maturing more as an athlete. So the one thing I want to address is that, you know, during that season, I did not do a lot of distance training when it came to miles, when it came to you know, he's going out for, you know, a 30 to 40, maybe even 50 minute exercise. I, it really wasn't really much of that last season. For me, last season, it was a lot of short reps, you know, a lot of 150s, a lot of 350s, a lot of 500s. You know, I was getting a lot of my fitness and a lot of my endurance based upon my workouts and, you know, how I was treating my body after. But then this season, you know, it's been a lot more of a slower grind. Last year, you know, I would utilize the bike, I would utilize the pool, which cross training is good. Cross training is, is utilized very well at the division one level. But I do feel like you get a different type of fitness and endurance when you do put in those miles. I think that was something that I neglected last season and didn't, you know, use enough of was not putting enough enough miles. I think I was a little bit scared and haunted for my freshman season because my freshman season, I did put in so much work when it came to the mileage part of, of running. So when I got to my sophomore season, I'm, I'm not doing no miles. I don't want to get a stress fracture again in my leg. And so when I got to the end of the season, all the wires in my body were just cooked. You know, I didn't have the endurance that I needed. And I was still performing well. I was still putting up, you know, 47 seconds in the in the 400. I was still putting up 150, you know, 149 and 800, which are respectable marks, but it really wasn't to where I wanted it to be. So what I've taken from, from these last two seasons is that I need a, a healthy combination of both, a healthy combination of mileage and a healthy combination of speed work. Because, you know, freshman year, neglected the speed, just did straight miles. Last year, did straight speed, neglected the miles. Both seasons were all right. But, you know, hand in hand, you know, looking at it and, you know, forcing it right now, putting that combination, you know, is, is what's going to work best for me. And so looking back at that video, uh, I talked a lot about your diet. I talked a lot about sleeping and I talked a lot about, you know, just overall strategy. And so the first thing I want to go into is the strategy. So if you didn't, if you're just now tuning in, you didn't have the chance to see that video. Uh, the recap of what I could give is when you first get the baton in a four by four, my first thing um, that people talk about is free energy. It's the first seven seconds of your run. And so whenever, let's say I'm running for 400 meters, my first first step for the next, you know, four or five seconds after that is, is free energy. You're not going to get that time back. Rather you start slow, rather you start fast, it does not matter. And so in all in all, you have to start fast. You have to use those first seven seconds to set you up for your race. Because after you go for your first seven seconds, after you start flying off the curve, you enter to what I call the float phase. The float phase is the 400 is you basically just using that energy you produce with those first seven seconds as momentum to carry you into the next phase of your race. So like I mentioned before, you have the first seven seconds, you're getting out, it's free energy. From there, you transition into the float phase, which is you basically utilizing your breathing, making powerful steps into the ground, using your momentum, using your arms, form, form, form. That's what I like to think of. And so after that's about done, you're probably going to be around the you know 150 to 175 mark. And right here is really where you have to lock in mentally. You know, at that 200 meter mark is where things start getting you know, a little bit scary. You're halfway through the race, but you act, you're really starting to feel it now. You know, my PR, my PR in the 200, like probably like a high 21, like 21.9, maybe 21.8 on a good day. But, you know, I'm coming through in, you know, 25, 22.5, 22.7. And so it's very difficult to, you know, run at 97 to 95% of your 200 with still 200 more meters to go. But I guess that's the advantage of being an 800 meter runner. You're able to utilize, you know, your endurance. You're able to utilize your stamina because you don't get as tired as a, as a sprinter would. A lot of sprinters, when they run the 400, they go balls to the wall the first 200 meters. They drop like, you know, 21 fives, 21 fours. Me, I'm never going to get to that level as an 800 meter runner. The best way I can describe how to run a 47 second 400 meter runner is from 400 meter run is from an 800 meter perspective. But as long as you're still getting the 47s out of it, for anybody listening out there, that's, uh, you know, you just got to make it your own way. The person who taught me how to run the 40, uh, uh, 400 meter, you know, 47 second was a sprinter. And I kind of took it and ran with it in, in my own way. So as we're talking about before, you know, you're, you're 200 meters into this race. And rather you're on an indoor track or outdoor track, the same applications still apply. You, you have to utilize the curves to your advantage. You can't full out sprint the curves. The shortest distance between two points is a straight line. So that's why, obviously, the straightaways, you're able to open up a lot more than you are the curve. On the curve, you have to lean into it is the best way that I can describe it, especially on the Nebraska indoor track. It's a hydraulic track. It's innovative. It's, it's raised up a little bit. So you have to push into the curve 
and then basically float down. So like when you're coming up uh, across the straightaway onto a curve, you have to like take like a, it's a very specific, like powerful step to the outside of the track. They call it the slingshot method. That's what I like to utilize it as. I, I push myself to the outside. I push, I push, I push. And then when I'm coming down, like when I'm at the very top of the curve, I kind of use my momentum to like draw myself to the left side of my body and I'm slingshotting across the track. You know, rather you're the first leg or the third leg, the first leg is a little bit different because when you're slingshotting, you have to break. But then for me, I'm most of the time I'm in lane one. And when I'm in the lane one and I'm slingshotting, the effect is going to drag me all the way to the finish. And so uh, to recap everything we just mentioned. So the first seven seconds of your race is free energy from zero to seven. Get out as fast as you can. After that, you're going to float. Your float phase is you just utilizing your arms, your knee drives high, keep it 90 degrees, dorsiflex. To be dorsiflex with your feet is meaning when you're picking up each leg. So let's say I'm running and my right knee is up. You want to make sure your foot is up as well. Your toe is facing up. If you leave your toe down, your legs are going to naturally want to drag down. But if I'm dorsiflexing my toe, dorsiflexing my feet, my legs are going to want to shoot up and that's going to give me a better stride length and then less steps on the track. The less steps you take, the better. The more steps you take, it's going to slow you down. You're going to utilize more energy. The 400-meter run is all about conserving and utilizing energy. When you utilize your energy and conserve it better, it's, it's, going, to, it's, going, to lead, it's going to have you, those last 100 meters, not dying as much. They say that the person who wins these races is the person who slows down the least, which I believe to be 100% true, especially me being an 800-meter runner, a stamina-based runner. It's basically whoever can start, you know, start the fastest and stay key utilize that so that was my quick tutorial and breakdown on how to run a 47 second run and so after this i'm going to kind of give you guys a quick little breakdown on how i you know use that as my to my advantage for my 800s and yeah we'll get back to that Mario fue pintor más de 30 años. Cuando me dijo que se le estaban olvidando las cosas, fue difícil. Un día me dijo, me dijeron que pintara el marco del lado por dentro y pinté el lado de afuera. Yo le di a la gente que le diga a su familia lo que está pasando con él. Si algo se nota diferente, podría ser Alzheimer. Es momento de hablarlo. Visita alz.org diagonal nuestras historias para saber más. Un mensaje de the Alzheimer's Association y the Ad Council. This is Brad with Midwest Bank, proudly serving our Nebraska communities for over 70 years. We're a community bank, making local decisions, supporting local organizations, and helping local businesses and farms succeed. We are dedicated to serving our clients and helping them meet their financial needs with sound, innovative banking solutions. From an array of checking and deposit accounts, cash management services, to small business, real estate, and ag lending. We're here for you, your community, your bank, Midwest Bank. Find out more at MidwestBank.com. Member FDIC. Sometimes I just cannot believe all the storms we've gone through here. I can only hope that we'll be able to leave this house to you one day, baby. You're our legacy. Planning for these disasters will make sure we're safe. And it's the best way to protect that legacy. Protect your legacy. Visit ready.gov forward slash plan for the tools and tips you need to start your emergency preparedness plan today. Brought to you by FEMA and the Ad Council. The captain for Sean Jackson. Coach Osborne's here. Do you think the option can work in this era of football right here? If you can do something and do it well that other people don't see all the time, it's an advantage. So that's why I think particularly today, I would think being a good option team would would uh, give you an edge. And then, then if you could run a few passes, come off of that. And that's what happened last week with, uh, with Malachi Coleman. You know, they'd run a few options and pretty soon their safety is worth committing. And then all of a sudden, uh, Malachi's got a lot of room to run back. This is where it happens. Long hikes with friends, kayaking adventures with family, more horseback riding, zip line gliding, rock face climbing, hammock camping fun than you could ever imagine. And it's all outdoors, amongst the trees and across the prairie, here beneath Nebraska skies. Plan an outing today at yournebraskaadventure.com. Sponsored by Nebraska Game and Parks, aired with the Nebraska Broadcasters Association and this station. Getting experience to jumpstart a meaningful career can be difficult and education can cost a fortune. Luckily, AmeriCorps can be the solution. With AmeriCorps, you'll earn a stipend and education award while helping people. Plus, you'll gain professional skills and make connections to help you build your career. If you're ready to start a career you can be proud of, visit serve.nebraska.gov service to find a program for you. Paid for by service 
from Nebraska, aired with the Nebraska Broadcasters Association and this station. When it comes to making plans, you are the best. What about those round trips, which are perfect on your way there and perfect on your way back? Or those meetings with friends, surprise parties, camps, birthdays. The same way you plan for the important moments, start planning to protect you and your loved ones from a natural disaster. Sign up for local weather and emergency alerts. Prepare an emergency kit and make a family communications plan. Get started at ready.gov slash plan. Brought to you by FEMA and the Ad Council. This is your captain. We are going to be experiencing some slight turbulence. Please fasten your, oh, hold on. Just got a video of my cat. Imagine the pilot of an airplane was as confident as you are texting and driving. Seems kind of crazy when you put it like that. Visit stoptextstoprex.org. A message brought to you by the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, Project Yellow Light, and the Ad Council. I'm Christy. I used to smoke cigarettes. I had smoker's cough and severe shortness of breath, and I knew I had to quit. Then I tried e-cigarettes, but I just ended up using both. I really didn't start to get better until I quit smoking completely. My tip to you is just cutting down on the number of cigarettes you smoke isn't enough. Call the Nebraska Tobacco Quit Line. 1-800-QUIT-NOW. 1-800-784-8669. Paid for by Tobacco Free Nebraska. Aired with the Nebraska Broadcasters Association and this station. Hi, this is Pastor Tom. Did you know there's a place kids can seek out help when they're away from home and something goes wrong? They find themselves in a difficult spot or even a dangerous situation. Maybe another child is bullying them or a stranger is following them. Perhaps on a date and things just go bad. In Lincoln, here's where they can find help. It's called Safe Place. Safe Place is a national program for children taking place in thousands of cities across the United States. The People City Mission is sponsoring this program in our community and has set up a number of businesses, fire stations, schools, and nonprofits around the city to become safe locations where kids can seek out help. They just need to look for the big yellow sign that says Safe Place on it, then go inside and ask for help. We will be quickly connected to them and ensure they make it back home or to whatever resources are needed. If you'd like to find out more about Safe Place and ways in which you can get involved, just go to PCMLincoln.org. Remember, when we all do a little, we change a lot. School bus drivers, custodians, paraeducators, and the list goes on of all the education support professionals who help every school in Nebraska run smoothly. They ensure that our students have a safe ride to school, healthy meals, and a clean environment to learn. I'm Jenny Benson, president of the Nebraska State Education Association. Take a moment to say thank you to the support staff at your child's school. Sponsored by the Nebraska State Education Association, aired by the Nebraska Broadcasters Association in this station. Dance like a dad. It's a great way to make a moment with your kids. First, I hold my hands out like they're on a steering wheel. Then I look over my shoulder. Next, oh, I put it in reverse. Me, me, me. Visit fatherhood.gov. Brought to you by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services and the Ad Council. College football in Lincoln, America. The time has come. Start your game day off right with the A1 Automotive Ticket Tailgate Pregame Show. Join the ticket crew as they bring you all the coverage you need to get you ready for the action. It's the A1 Automotive Ticket Tailgate Pregame Show. Powered by Sunbelt Rentals. Ben Bleicher with Professional Realty Group of BHHS Ambassador. Select Plumbing. Jimmy John's. Lincoln Wall-to-Wall -wall Wine and Spirits. Fleet Beef. Pure's Cheese Bread. On 93.7 The Ticket and theticketfm.com. Start your Sundays off right with Jeff and Nicole Essink on Fitness Fanatics. Jeff and Nicole discuss health and wellness, how to achieve fitness goals, and more through the life of gym owners and gym goers. It's Fitness Fanatics from 9 to 11 a.m. on Sundays on 93.7 The Ticket and theticketfm.com. Back to the Ticket Weeknights on 93.7 The Ticket and theticketfm.com. All right, guys, we are back here for the last segment of 93.7 The Ticket, The Nico Project, live every single Sunday from 1 to 2 p.m. So as we were mentioning before, I was breaking down how to run a 47-second run in the 400. If you guys want to see a more in-depth breakdown earlier in this podcast, I, I replay one of my old YouTube videos that I made about 23 minutes long, breaking down step-by-step -step on how to plan and execute a 47-second run in the 400. If you guys are interested in seeing that episode, go ahead and look up on YouTube. How to run a 47 in the 400 and just type in my my name, which is Nico Schultz. 
But again, giving you guys a quick breakdown, you know, the first seven seconds of your race is crucial. You know, getting out fast, getting out aggressive. When you get out and you utilize that energy, you you push off the ground and utilize that energy, you're not going to get tired. It's, it's free energy. Your body, you know, it's like adrenaline. Um, you know, if you were, you know, getting chased by a bear, uh, you have free energy for the first, like, for seven seconds. You're not going to get tired at all. And those are very crucial steps. And so I like to utilize that when it comes to my my racing strategy. And so, like I said, first seven seconds, then you enter your float phase. After you enter your float phase, you go ahead and uh, you push again. You know, you don't really call it pushing, but you definitely are putting a lot more effort, you know, into the running before as, you know, as compared to when you were doing your floating. And then you float again. And then basically it's anything you have left at that point. You should be about, you know, anywhere from 325 to 350 meters. And you know, the last 50 meters of the 400, it sucks. Like there's no strategy around that besides holding your, keeping your form and keeping your willpower and trying not to die out, trying not to uh, let your legs just, you know, belt lactic acid get to you. And so something else I want to kind of get on is how I run my, my 800 meter runs. You know, I've ran a lot of different strategies throughout the years of, you know, running 800s. I started running the 800 run when I was in the seventh grade. My best time in the seventh grade was a 219, two minutes and 19 seconds. And currently it is a minute and 48 seconds. So I don't even know how many seconds that is, like 30 something seconds, 30, 40 seconds. I don't even know how fast that is now, but I've, I've had a big jump from over the years. And so my, my strategy has changed a lot. You know, in high school, I was always known as the guy who would get out crazy aggressive. I would get out stupid fast and everybody would, you know, kind of be playing catch up and in high school, nobody really was even near me. In high school, I would always just get out super fast and I was just kind of you know, running by myself. And that's what got me noticed by colleges because it's like, dude, this guy's out here running in a league of his own. Like we need to bring him to our school. And so I tried that in college and it genuinely just does not work. When you're going against guys who are just amazing cross-country athletes or guys who just have amazing fitness and know that, you know, kind of know when you're bluffing a little bit too. You know, when, when I was in high school and I was doing that, I know that the guys that I was racing did not have the endurance, the drive, or the power to keep up with me. But then here in college, you know, I'm facing, you know, guys who are, you know, within the same fitness levels as me. So I can't, you know, outperform somebody just off of a pure athletic ability, athletic ability, pure talent. I have to out strategize them. I have to out plan them and I have to basically play to my strengths. And so me being a former football player in high school, I'm kind of a, you know, a bigger runner right now. I'm about 157 pounds, 5'10 to give or take. And so when I run my races, I'm still kind of a power guy. You know, my weight room numbers are still pretty impressive at the moment. I'm putting up anywhere about like, you know, like 250 for like two or three and on hand clean in the weight room. And I can rep out 335 for about, you know, three to five times on squat. And so I'm a pretty powerful athlete. Not a lot of 800 runner guys can do that. And so, you know, the question is, how does a power 800 meter runner become successful within, you know, this division one level within the NCAA level? And so this is this is my strategy to it. So I love to be a front runner. I love being within the top three, two or one positions of the race. If I'm in the back of the pack, I mentally check out. I mentally tell myself, dang, what are you doing so far back here? I'm trash. And a lot of different runners are different. A lot of runners, you know, are very successful in the back of the pack. You know, they 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 kind of build up progressively throughout the race, kind of clip people off and just build up to those last hundred meters where they pass. People. But me, I'm completely different. I need to be in the front of the pack. And so. What I like to do is I like I like to get out fast. I like to utilize my seven seconds, not as aggressive as I do in my 400 meter running, but definitely is more aggressive than a lot of, you know, the average 800 meter runners. So the gun goes off those first seven seconds. I get out quick. I'm in my float phase for a while. You know, I like to come across my 200 meter marks in about, you know, 27 to 28 seconds. From there, I go to th through 400 anywhere around 52 to 54 seconds. And I'm still in the front of the pack coming to the cross 600. I'd like to be around 118, 120, 121, and then just give it hell. The last 200 meters of my race, you know, I like to run in front. I like to run aggressive. And that's why I ran my 148 to make the number five all time mark in the 800 meter run in Nebraska history. So this was the Nico project live from 1 to 2 p.m. Hopefully you guys learned a little bit about what it means to be a division one track and field runner. So stay tuned, guys. Thanks for watching. And we'll be out here shortly. Bye. Belmont Chiropractic and Novotny Nutrition and Wellness specialize in getting rid of people's pain quickly and permanently. For 31 years, they've been extremely successful with advanced techniques and pain relief using spinal adjustments and decompression, detoxification, diet and lifestyle modification, and more. 
They are fully equipped to handle the most seasonal athlete, weekend warrior, car accidents, strains, sprains, and more. Is there anywhere you're experiencing pain on your body or are you fighting decreased energy and depression? Consult Belmont Chiropractic and Novotny Nutrition and Wellness first at 402-476-8619. Adoption of teens from foster care is a topic not enough people know about, and we're here to change that. I'm April Dinwiddie, host of the new podcast, Navigating Adoption, presented by Adopt US Kids. Each episode brings you compelling real life adoption stories told by the families that live them with commentary from experts. Visit adoptuskids.org slash podcast or subscribe to Navigating Adoption, presented by Adopt US Kids. Brought to you by the US Department of Health and Human Services Administration for Children and Families and the Ad Council. There's no better way to spark a child's imagination than to get lost in the adventure of a good book. I'm Jenny Benson, president of NSEA. Working together, parents and teachers can help. Welcome every back, child everybody, from nine to three seven you can the ticket. Help to your child and let your child read to you. Encourage reading in your home and make it a priority. Make reading fun and a time that you and your child look forward to spending together. Sponsored by the Nebraska State Education Association, aired by the Nebraska Broadcasters Association on the station. A Shiro's work is never done. You care for the house, the kids, and our future. We're so grateful for all you do. Now, it's time to care for yourself and save a little more for retirement. A free three-minute online chat can give you the personalized tips you need to boost your retirement savings now. Visit aceyourretirement.org slash Shiro today. A public service announcement brought to you by AARP and the Ad Council. This is where it happens. Long hikes with friends, kayaking adventures with family, more horseback riding, zip line gliding, rock face climbing, hammock camping fun than you could ever imagine. And it's all outdoors, amongst the trees and across the prairie, here beneath Nebraska skies. Plan an outing today at yournebraskaadventure.com. Sponsored by Nebraska Game and Parks, aired with the Nebraska Broadcasters Association and this station. Finally, a good reason to have a smart house. Just say, Alexa, play 93.7 The Ticket, and we'll magically start playing. How's it work? Nobody knows. Don't ask questions. I'm Christy. I used to smoke cigarettes. I had smoker's cough and severe shortness of breath, and I knew I had to quit. Then I tried e-cigarettes, but... I just ended up using both. I really didn't start to get better until I quit smoking completely. My tip to you is just cutting down on the number of cigarettes you smoke isn't enough. Call the Nebraska Tobacco Quit Line. 1-800-QUIT-NOW. 1-800-784-8669. Paid for by Tobacco Free Nebraska. Aired with the Nebraska Broadcasters Association and this station. Tune in to 93.7 The Ticket as soon as the clock hits zero for the Jay Foreman Postgame Show. Listen to expert analysis from the Husker Hall of Famer, an eight-year NFL veteran for 90 minutes after the game. The Jay Foreman Postgame Show. Sponsored by Tanner's Bar and Grill. Vinny Krikak and Action Plumbing, Heating, AC, and Electrical on 93.7 The Ticket and theticketfm.com. My early Alzheimer's diagnosis was hard to take. But it gave my mom and me more time to plan together. Talk to your family about seeing a doctor. Go to alz.org slash time to talk. A message from the Alzheimer's Association and the Ad Council. Whether it's playing on a sports team or creating art, it's important to encourage your kids to explore their interests. I'm Jenny Benson, president of the Nebraska State Education Association. Let your child know you believe in their passions. It can contribute to your child's focus and improve the quality of their schoolwork too. So show that budding scientist some encouragement by helping them with an experiment or play catch with your baseball enthusiast. Sponsored by the Nebraska State Education Association, aired by the Nebraska Broadcasters Association in this station. A Shiro's work is never done. You care for the house, the kids, and our future. We're so grateful for all you do. Now, it's time to care for yourself and save a little more for retirement. A free three-minute online chat can give you the personalized tips you need to boost your retirement savings now. Visit aceyourretirement.org slash Shiro today. A public service announcement brought to you by AARP and the Ad Council.
My early Alzheimer's diagnosis was hard to take. But it gave my mom and me more time to plan, together. Talk to your family about seeing a doctor. Go to alz.org slash time to talk. A message from the Alzheimer's Association and the Ad Council. This is Lincoln's home for sports talk on the FM dial. Also online at theticketfm.com. On the internet. KNTK FM Firth, 93.7 The Ticket. Live from the heart of Lincoln, America, welcome to Ticket Weeknights on 93.7 The Ticket and theticketfm.com. Welcome back, everybody, to the Nico at Night podcast live every single Sundays from 2 to 3 p.m. And I also have my own personal hour show before this called the Nico Project from 1 to 2 p.m. So you get a whole hour of listening to me and what I'm about from 1 to 3 every single Sunday live here at 937 The Ticket. And so what I like to do every single Sunday from 2 to 3 is give you guys some insiders access to Nebraska student athletes here inside of Memorial Stadium. Each and every single day, I'm surrounded by, you know, a numerous amounts of different athletes, whether it comes to the sport of gymnastics, track, basketball, football, the list goes on and on and on. And so this week, I have two individual athletes for you guys to listen to. So during the week, I got a chance to catch uh, Genesis Gibson. Genesis is a gymnastics athlete who specializes in bars. She also does a little bit of beam on the gymnastics floor. She is from Texas. And so... She it has a very great story for you guys. She is currently studying criminal justice and also wants to be in a lawyer as well. So she's a very smart individual. Uh, she's very talented as well. She had a very untraditional or non-traditional story of how she got to the University of Nebraska, just like myself, which is really cool to listen to. And then after her, I have national champion Axelina Johansson all the way from Sweden. And so I have two great you know, athletes for you here, guys, today. But for the first episode, I'm going to give you guys the gymnastics athlete I just mentioned, Genesis Gibson. So without further ado, Get to me, get to know Genesis. We're back here live for another episode of Nico at Night podcast. And to my right here, I have the amazing Genesis Gibson. Genesis is a gymnastics athlete here at the University of Nebraska. She is from Texas. She currently is studying criminal justice to become a lawyer one day. And currently here at the University of Nebraska, she competes on the bars, but then she also trains beam as well. Some of her accomplishments, she has competed for Ecuador back in, I think, like, you know, a year or two ago. And, you know, she has had a, a very interesting career here at the University of Nebraska, to say the least. She's been through a lot of things and she's still persevering to this day, has a lot of different things going on from her day to day life. And I'm excited for you guys get, to get to know her. So, Genesis, how are you feeling about being on the podcast today? I'm really excited. Thank you for having me. Of course, of course. Well, let's go ahead and start this podcast off. The way I like to start every podcast off is asking, why did you come to the University of Nebraska? The coaching staff, 100%. I think that they just made me feel welcomed and they made me feel like they had faith in me. And that's something that I didn't feel like I had. I was not a strong recruit. So just for Heather to have that faith in me that I could achieve my goals that I had when I was a little girl, that meant more than anything to me. Right, right. Yeah, that is co- that is big. A, a coach that really believes in you and, you know, especially being the fact that you weren't a strong recu- a recruit, because I wasn't one either. Mm-hmm. When I was coming to uh, the University of Nebraska, I wasn't a strong recruit and had a coach that really believes in me. And so I remember before the podcast, we were mentioning that you were actually committed somewhere else pretty late. You know, you were you were planning on going to that school and then you ended up committing and making the switch. So go ahead and tell the people that story. Yeah. So I actually did cheer in high school because I actually like stopped gymnastics for a while because my back was just really bad. And um, so I did cheer in high school and then I was just like thinking about what was next for me. And I didn't know if I could do college gymnastics. I didn't think I was good enough. And I always knew that cheer I was good at because of gymnastics. So I was like, okay, well, that's another route that I could take. Um, I applied at Abilene Christian University, and I tried out for the team. I made the team. Um, And then right after that is when I actually started getting in contact with Heather, and I was like, okay, maybe this could actually be a thing. I could go to Nebraska. Like, that's crazy. Um, I ended up committing with Nebraska, and then I was like, I had to call up the ACU cheer coach, and I was like, hey, um, I'm so sorry. I actually can't. be on the team I'm committing somewhere else and that's kind of how that happened <laughs> man that is that is a very difficult decision to have to switch last minute like that and I think the exact date you said was June 18th June 8th June, June 8th. 8th yeah I like committed two months before I came to Nebraska <laughs> so it was super late notice 
But yeah, I was just like on a whim. I was like, okay, I guess here we go. So I was kind of like a trial run. Right. So they weren't completely sure about me and I wasn't sure of myself either, but <laughs> you know, made it work. So. Hey, to have the talent like that, cause you didn't mention that, you know, you did cheer all throughout high school and then you ended up making the switch to the, or sorry, one year. My senior year. Your senior year, and she stopped stopped that whole entire time, committed to do cheer, and the last minute, it's like, you know what? I'm just going to go to a, a Power 5 Big <laughs> 10 school. I'll go back to gymnastics, <laughs> I guess. <laughs> yeah, I can choose to go back to gymnastics real quick. Yeah. And so, okay, let's jump into, you know, when you got to the here to the University of Nebraska. And so COVID was still alive and well back, you know, early in 2021. And she has a very interesting story about her college debut, actually. She ended up catching COVID literally, I think, a week before and having to compete because everyone else was sick or there was, wasn't enough girls. Go ahead and tell that story. Yeah, for sure. I ended up getting COVID in December and I was quarantined in a hotel for nine days, like no training, nothing, just pretty much on bed rest in a hotel <laughs> for literally longer than a week. We had a competition really soon after that. I had about a week to prepare after I got out of quarantine and I was not hitting my routines. I was like, my endurance is rough right now. Like I am not making my routines and I know myself, like I train how I compete. Um, like pressure usually doesn't really get to me. So whenever I couldn't make my routine in practice, I'm like, I'm, it's not happening in the meet. Like that's not happening. So I went to my coach. I was like, you need to put someone else in. He was like, you have to go in because we have six girls who have a bar routine. We have, we got to put in six people in a meet. So you're going up. And I was like, oh, okay, great. You know, <laughs> wonderful. I didn't make it. Um, I fell on like a pirouette, if you know what that is. I don't know if is whoever's that? watching. It's literally like uh, you switch your hand and you go over the bar like that. Like yeah. it's it's like after one of my releases and it's the easiest skill in my routine and I fell on it. So that's how that went. Um, but I made every routine after that, after that meet, the practices after that were really good and ended up doing well the rest of the season. So yeah. <laughs> So with COVID being a factor that, uh, and that being, you know, your first ever collegiate Big Ten, yeah. just me, ends up falling on one of the easiest routines, which which is unfortunate. And then, you know, you get you get the hang of things. And then a little bit after that, too. So if you guys don't know, I had a stress fracture in my left leg. And so I go to the gymnastics room to get to, a, I think it was the ortho, orthopedics doctor. So I'm in there. He's telling me, yeah, bro, you're out for four or five months. You're done. Get out of here. Get some crutches. Like, get an X-ray. Get an MRI. But you're done. And then to my left, I see her coach carrying her, like, like literally like cradling her, bringing her in. And she's like, her leg's gone. And her, her boyfriend and her coach are just there. She puts her on the table because, like, that was before the doctor told me all this. And I'm just watching her situation go down. And then, and then her coach is like, all right, doc, tell me, can she compete tomorrow? He's like, bro, no, her leg's like sideways. Ended up tearing her MCL. Just absolute, I was, like, looking at her leg, like, that don't look right. And, like, she can't even walk. And he's like, so, you know, tell me, doc, how long are we thinking? He's like, what do you mean how long we're thinking? So tell, tell your perspective of that because that was mine. That was mine. No, it's actually funny how I got hurt. Um, so basically my grip that I had, I used like this really weird brand that they used at my old gym and basically the buckle, what happened was the hole like went through the other end of the buckle. I don't know if that makes sense. Okay. It's, it's hard to explain. Basically my whole grip came off in the middle of while I was doing a dismount on bars and I went flying and I ended up landing in a froggy position so hard on my knees. I, I pretty much sprained both of my knees, but it was mostly my left um, MCL area. Um, and I, yeah, I was out the rest of the season that year. So, But yeah, that's pretty much how that happened. Jeez. So ends up, you know, hitting a little froggy position, busting both of her knees, yeah, yeah. gets out for the rest of the season. And unfortunately, she can't register because she already comed competed in too many competitions. And so go ahead. That was actually going to lead me into my next point. You know, I was going to ask you, you know, what's kind of been the hardest difficulty, hardest situation you've been in here at the University of Nebraska and how have you gotten over it? Ooh. Okay, yeah. I think for me it was like the transition of the gymnastics culture because in club, it's very individualized and it's very, I don't know how to describe it. It's just, it's not the team atmosphere. It's like, all right, you're on your own, kid, and do what you can do. Hopefully, you get recruited. Yeah. But here, it's like, you're applauding every single one of your teammates' successes because it's also your success. And that's what you learn here at Nebraska and being on a team. 
um, whenever someone else goes up and they stick that landing, that's also your stick because it's a team effort. And at the end of the day, that's what's going to get us to beat the other opponent. Right. Yeah. That's a great answer. I mean, there's so many people from so many different, you know, walks of life. I mean, where you come from in your gym might be different from where somebody else came from. And so I've inter actually interviewed a lot of other gymnastics athletes, and they all say the same thing. They're like, coming here was a literal culture shock. I mean, how you guys, you know, do everything as a team, how team-oriented you guys are. I mean, it's it's a big shock. And, like, you know, my track team, I mean, we're, we're deep. We're, like, 150 people deep versus you guys. What are you guys, 18, 20 people? Yeah, 22. 22 people. Mm -hmm. So it's very different. And so... Uh, getting into that, you know, each person being very different. Uh, can you talk about the transition of, well, you know, the type of person that you've become, you know, from freshman year up until now, kind of the things you've learned, maybe, you know, a change in morals, a change in who you hang, hang, hang around with. Um, you know, I, I know I've changed personally. I, I was a lot more different than I was my freshman year. But if you can tell the people and recognize, you know, how have you changed? Yeah. Um, you know, I think that I've seen myself grow as a leader in the gym, um, I know my freshman year, I was just, I was just trying to survive. I feel like <laughs> I, um, I was just trying to take it day by day, and I mean that's all you can do. I mean right now I'm trying to take it day by day, but right, but being in the position that I'm in, I can at least, you know, help the freshmen. Or if you're like most guys with symptoms, you don't like, want to hey, ask. I was once in that situation Perhaps a free too. consult like with a men's health experts will encourage you. Hey, what you could out. it hurt? Limitless knows together. exactly. Um, I feel like my freshman year I didn't really have that and so just growing into someone that I wish I had my freshman year is something that's been really big for me I guess um, yeah I don't really have much to add on that no, that's powerful. But, I completely yeah. understand that. just yeah. to like have that person to like if you're just having a hard time like come with me we'll, we'll have a hard time together you know instead of seeing someone struggle alone so. so you've become the person that you wish you had your freshman year. Yes, that, that was huge for me, yeah, being a leader in that way. Yeah, that's amazing to recognize. I almost feel like I had that for, for my group, at least in the 800. There was nobody else around like that was pushing me like that, that was leading me. And so like I told myself, when I'm like this age, I'm going to do the same thing. And that's awesome for you in your situation. And we almost have similar situations. I mean, like I told you, we were in the same exact you know spot, in the same exact day, same exact injury. We're like, you know, yours a little bit worse than mine. I had a fracture. You had a torn, torn MCO. You were probably out around. Yeah, well, you like four months, right? Well, it was more like half a year, I feel oh, like. God. To like actually get back to where I was, yeah. it was rough. But. Yeah, yeah, we've both been through it. I mean, college, like I said, some people have success. Some people get, you know, wake up. Some people, you know, get a reality check. I mean, for me, it was definitely like, dang, like track isn't everything. And for her, the same same thing. Yeah, um, uh, switching things up a little bit. So going into your personal life, what inspired you to want to study law, criminal justice? Can you go ahead and talk about that realm? You know, do you know any lawyers? You know, what's your what was the, the drive to your passion? Yeah, for sure. Um, you know, it's interesting. So my mom was in the military, and she didn't tell me what she studied until I actually made my decision of what I was going to major in. In high school? Yeah, like out of <laughs> high school, like all my college applications, like I was like, I want criminal justice. And I think what really stemmed that was my forensics class that I took yeah. in high school. I was like, I love this. So I was like, I'm going to do that. Um, but my mom was like, I studied criminal justice in – military in the military really? yeah and I just I was like this has to be like in our blood <laughs> or something I don't know um but yeah I've had family that has been in involved in the law department so um I think that's what really inspired me to actually get started with it um of course we love a job that serves the money Obviously. we love that um <laughs> But also, it's just about helping those people that really need it. I, I'm just a person who, I, when I see someone who needs help, like, I'm that first person to try to help them. I just feel like it's kind of like my calling in life to be that person for somebody. So whether that means doing that in a court, defending someone, maybe they're a drug addict, helping them get that rehabilitation they need, just right. for an example. So. Right. And so far in your career studying this, I mean, is it everything that you thought it'd be? I mean, I know another lawyer, actually, and, you know, he is always studying 24-7. He's on a very strict resume, very disciplined. So, I mean, you got to, you know, be an absolute book fanatic. you got to be able to study a lot. you got to be able to read people. So can you tell the people, you know, what it's been like? Because I only see it from the outside perspective. What, what is it like living it? Yeah. So I'm actually a B-law major. Or, sorry, B-law minor. Um, my major is criminal justice. But 
Those have been the hardest classes, 100%. I am currently in civil and criminal litigation, and it is ran like a law class. You get cold called. So you better get, like, you have to make sure you do the readings. You have to make sure you understand what you're reading and you know the terms that applies to the cases you're reading. Um, so every time you go into class, you need to be prepared knowing you could get cold called and you don't want to embarrass yourself. Mm. That is probably the worst thing ever. So... It's, it's, it gives me anxiety sometimes, but I just have to keep reminding myself what the bigger picture is, what my goals are, making it in law school. And yeah, that's honestly what I get to keep my mind on. So. <laughs> Yeah, that's amazing. And it's got to give you like a sense of power too. I mean, you're doing what so little people have, have done before. I mean, to, to, you know, be studying law, to be into criminal justice like this and also be a full-time division one athlete on top of that. I mean, yeah. you're juggling a lot. I mean, you have so many different hats that you're putting on each and every single day. Yeah. Um, and so I want I want to kind of, you know, get to where that came from. I mean, from Texas, you did mention that you could, we go to the second biggest high school in all of Texas. Um, they're building, I think, the number one biggest, you know, high school, Texas football stadium. And if you know Texas for anything, that that's all they're known for is actually, or that's one of the biggest things. Everything's bigger in Texas and especially high school football, but not even just high school football. I mean, we were talking about before this podcast to her or other gymnastics friends, and she was mentioning all these big name schools that they go to, you know, Florida, mm -hmm. Alabama. She was mentioning that a, a few of her friends are actually already qualified for the Olympics. And so just go ahead and tell me, you know, what was the Texas life like? Do you think it prepared you for college? And do you plan to move there after? Oh, that's a good question. Okay. Uh, one, I would totally move back. Mm -hmm. I love Texas so much. The heat? Yes, I love the heat. So the Nebraska cold here is rough <laughs> on me. It's definitely rough. But, um, yeah, the um, whenever I, I grew up at WOGA, uh, my club gym, and it absolutely prepared me for – everything that was going to be thrown at me for ne with Nebraska. And I think the time management skills that I acquired whenever I was there totally, completely helped me transition. Um, my schedule, it was very, very structured. And it, that's how it also is here now. So that's what's also helped. But my schedule was 7.30 to 11.30 I had practice. Um, 11.30 to 4, I had school upstairs in the same facility with – two private teachers, and then I went back downstairs, four to seven, practice again, and that's when I could go home. So I was living pretty much a full-time job for seven years of my life. <laughs> for seven years. For seven years, and I was just a kid. I was really just a kid. And so, you know, a part of me, I, like, kind of lost that childhood aspect to it, but I also learned such valuable lessons and skills at such a young age, and that's what, what has really helped me thrive here in Nebraska. That's amazing. I mean, you've been at it for so long. I mean, as you mentioned before, seven years, you're coming to college, you've been through a lot of things. I mean, there's been so much that's been put on your mental, put on the soul, put on the, you know, the body, the stresses. And a lot of people, too, I mean, they come here and they have aspirations to go pro. And as I was, you know, talking to you, you said, you said like, you know, once that, um, you know, my fourth year is done, I'm just ready to start my career. I'm ready to start my goals. I mean, are you, how does it feel to, you know, like know that the next chapter of your life is coming? I mean, it was a super big jump from eighth grade to freshman year. You're finally in high school and you get to high, you know, you go all through high school to get to college and now you're finally here. I mean, how are you feeling about that next chapter? Yeah, I mean, coming from high school to here was a huge jump for me. I've noticed significant changes even just since I walked through the doors here. Um, but thinking about the next chapter, I'm just excited about it. Um, I believe that everything happens for a reason and the way things unfold, they happen for a purpose, whether that's for you or for someone else. So I'm just, I'm ready to see what life has in store for me. And I know it's all good things. So I'm just ready to see it. Honestly, I'm yeah. excited. Yeah, of course. And so Genesis, you've been killing this podcast. And, you know, I want you to go ahead and tell, you know, anybody that wants to be in your position. I mean, you're absolutely rocking it right now. Like I said, you're doing so many good things when it comes to, you know, your morals. Or just your form. I mean, you did say that all you want to do is, you know, help the other person, rather that's physically, rather that's, you know, in a courtroom, rather it's with rehabilitation. You're also inspiring a bunch of people, too, especially on you know, the girls that want to be in your position here at the University of Nebraska being, in, you know, gymnastics. What advice would you have for any of those people that are watching right now, you know, who need that little boost or who even want to get to, to your position? Maybe there's somebody out there who wants to study what you study or, or do what you do maybe, maybe it's the bars maybe it's the beam what would you tell them what advice yeah keep knocking on that door and whenever I mean that I mean the more you try at something it the door is going to open eventually so just keep at it keep your head down stay humble do your work I know it's hard in the moment but the prize at the end is so much greater than that and honestly just 
believe in yourself. I feel like that was a huge one when I actually came to Nebraska, whenever I competed bars. I I remember Brian telling me, he was like, you, you just, I just think you don't believe in yourself and you need to start believing in yourself. Brian's my bar coach, by the way. And I think like, when everyone else started believing in me, like I felt that too. So just be around people who support you and love you. And honestly, just know that things are gonna happen for a reason and just go with the flow. Just take things as they come. That's, that's pretty much all that I could provide out there. <laughs> Day by day. And actually, yeah, day one day. thing I did not actually cover is, you know, a few weeks back, me and Genesis, we rocked out a, a, a Nebraska, uh, what is it, Husker Hispanic Heritage Month video together. And so we were practicing and brushing up on our Spanish. And I did want to ask you, since you are half Mexican, is uh, do you want to teach your kids Spanish in the future? I know your Spanish is very well. You grew up speaking Spanish a little bit with your family. Um, do you, is that something that you value on, you know? <laughs> yes, absolutely. I would love to teach my kids Spanish. Um, I, I hope they end up more fluent than me because I know like I, I did lose it a little bit over the years. Um, so I hope to integrate it much better into their lives than it was into mine. <laughs> Hey, you and me both. I'm trying the same exact thing. <laughs> I definitely did lose it. But Genesis, thank you so much for coming on this podcast, everybody. This was the Nico and I podcast here inside of Memorial Stadium. Stay tuned for, for a lot more episodes like this. Peace. You don't want to ask for help. Perhaps a free consult with the men's health experts will encourage you. What could it hurt? Limitless knows exactly how to treat your symptoms. They will verify with a blood test, and in a very short time, you'll feel like a new man. So don't drag your feet. You're not going to feel better unless you get help. The providers at Limitless know what they're doing. To receive your custom treatment plan, schedule online at limitlessmail.com and get your life back. When you were a kid, Clubs were cool. Robotics club, or space club, and stuff like that. But what do adults get? Book clubs and quilting clubs? No, nah, forget that. How about a margarita club? Get to Upside Bar and Lounge and join the best club in town. Ten flavors of margarita like Maui Wow, Burnt Pineapple, and Mango Tango. Try all ten of them and receive your own souvenir margarita glass. Make it your new Monday night tradition. $4 margaritas and $4 taco baskets. Grab the crew and head on over. Monday nights or any night. Upside Bar and Lounge at 29th and Pine Lake. So what's this new concept happening at 1040 O Street? There's 93.7 The Ticket, there's The Mill Coffee and Tea, and there's Grandma's Bake Shop and Beatrice Bakery? Well, yeah, it's all of those things. It's a place for the community to hang out, grab a drink and a bite, and just chill. Or work, or meet, or chat, or whatever you want to do. 93.7 The Ticket, The Mill Coffee and Tea, Grandma's Bake Shop and Beatrice Bakery. All together at 1040 O Street. There's no better way to spark a child's imagination than to get lost in the adventure of a good book. I'm Jenny Benson, president of NSEA. Working together, parents and teachers can help every child succeed. You can help by reading to your child and let your child read to you. Encourage reading in your home and make it a priority. Make reading fun and a time that you and your child look forward to spending together. Sponsored by the Nebraska State Education Association, aired by the Nebraska Broadcasters Association and the station. Hello, this is Mary Pat Waite. I've had the privilege of working with Lincoln Families as their realtor for more than 31 years, and I'm so proud to be associated with MP Dodge Real Estate. For me, your transaction is unique in its own way. My experience allows me to bring you trusted care and a really great outcome. My NP Dodge family shares the same client focus. Expand your career with NP Dodge. Call Eric at 402-434-2222. When you're high, you feel different. You think different, you talk different, you draw different, you listen to music different, but you probably knew that. Problem is, you also drive different and not in a good way. That's why driving high is illegal everywhere. So if you're high... Just don't drive. Make a plan to get a sober ride. Because if you feel different, you drive different. Brought to you by NHTSA and the Ad Council. I get it, slip it, cuff it, check it twice a day. I get it, slip it, cuff it, check it in the morning and before dinner. I get it, slip it, cuff it, check it, and share it with my doctor. Nearly one in two U.S. adults have high blood pressure. That's why it's important to self-monitor your blood pressure in four easy-to-remember steps. It starts with a monitor. 
Now that I know my blood pressure numbers, I talked with my doctor. We're getting those numbers down. Get it, slip it, cuff it, check it. Talk to doctor now and share it. Be next to talk to your doctor about your blood pressure numbers. Get down with your blood pressure. Self-monitoring is power. Learn more at manageyourbp.org. Brought to you by the Ad Council, the American Heart Association, and the American Medical Association. In partnership with the Office of Minority Health and Health Resources and Services Administration. Dance like a dad. It's a great way to make a moment with your kids. First, I hold my hands out like they're on a steering wheel. Then I look over my shoulder. Next, oh, I put it in reverse. Beep, beep, beep. Visit fatherhood.gov. Brought to you by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services and the Ad Council. I'm Christy. I used to smoke cigarettes. I had smoker's cough and severe shortness of breath. And I knew I had to quit. Then I tried e-cigarettes, but I just ended up using both. I really didn't start to get better until I quit smoking completely. My tip to you is just cutting down on the number of cigarettes you smoke isn't enough. Call the Nebraska Tobacco Quit Line. 1-800-QUIT-NOW. 1-800-784-8669. Paid for by Tobacco Free Nebraska. Aired with the Nebraska Broadcasters Association and this station. Alexa, play 93.7 The Ticket. Okay, playing 93.7 The Ticket. Alexa, turn down the lights. Dimming the lights. Alexa, order a pizza. The big one. All the toppings. Are you sure that's a good idea? Alexa. That's a lot of pizza for just one man. Alexa, just do it. Stop judging me, just do it. As you wish. Thanks, Alexa. You're my best friend. Finally, a good reason to have a smart house. Just say, Alexa, play 93.7 The Ticket, and we'll magically start playing. How's it work? Nobody knows. Don't ask questions. Sometimes I just cannot believe all the storms we've gone through here. I can only hope that we'll be able to leave this house to you one day, baby. You're our legacy. Planning for these disasters will make sure we're safe. And it's the best way to protect that legacy. Protect your legacy. Visit ready.gov forward slash plan for the tools and tips you need to start your emergency preparedness plan today. Brought to you by FEMA and the Ad Council. Early break with Sip and Jake. In my opinion, Nebraska is still in the driver's seat. Wow. To win this thing. They're in the driver's seat. That would be incredible. If Wisconsin hadn't lost uh, it's Braylon in a high ankle sprain, you don't play again that year. I mean, they're it, losing him is monumental. It'd be interesting to see a team that's missed so many bowl games in a row, to how, how they could handle potentially having the mentality of being in the driver's seat. Early break with Sip and Jake from 6 to 8 every weekday morning on 93.7 The Ticket. Back to the Ticket Weeknights on 93.7 The Ticket and theticketfm.com. Welcome back, everybody, to a Nico at Night podcast here inside of Memorial Stadium. It's not every single day that I get to interview a national champion, but today is the day that I finally get to interview another national champion before I did Rainbow the Javelin Thrower. And today I am with Axelina, the shot putter. So, Axelina, how are you feeling about being on our podcast today? I'm excited. I've, I've seen a lot of it, and I really <laughs> like it, so I'm happy to be a part of it. Of course, of course. Well, let me give you guys a little bit of a background to Axelina. So me and Axelina go way back as friends. We, we met each other fre our freshman year. Freshman year, we lived like literally right next to each other in the suites. And so uh, ever since then, we've been super cool. And Axelina has just absolutely been killing it these past, you know, two and a half, three years on the track. You know, she is a two-time Big Ten champion. She is a national champion. And on top of that, too, she's went to the European Championships where she's placed seventh. And she's even been to the World Championships where she's placed 13th and 12th place. So she is on the verge of having a crazy breakthrough season. I mean, the, the, the Olympic year is coming up. She does an amazing job of representing uh, Sweden. Um, and yeah, so Axelina, go ahead and tell the people, you know, why did you choose the University of Nebraska-Lincoln? Why did you come all the way from across the world to this university? I think it's just because of Justin Sinclair, uh, the coach I have right now. Uh, I actually signed with uh, North Dakota State University from the beginning. Really? Yeah, just because I basically just chose university out of, like, which coach I like the most. But also, after, like, um, if they had, like, the... The degree I wanted to do. Right. And what degree was that? Uh, graphic design. Okay. Yes. Um, so yeah, I've, I first signed with North Dakota State University, 
And then like in May, uh, Justine called me and was like, hey, do you, do you want to go to Nebraska? And I was like, yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> so um, yeah, I just had to redo all the paperwork and, and come over here. And it's, uh, it's a much better school than um, NDSU. So I'm really happy that he, he chose to come here and that I could come with him. Yeah. Yeah, Coach St. Clair is a great coach. And for you know the viewers out there who don't really know, last year, Coach Gary, or two years ago, sorry, Coach Gary Pepin was still a part of the track and field team. He was running the whole entire program. And then it was not until last year where he ended up retiring. And Coach St. Clair has been here since our freshman year as an assistant coach, but it wasn't up until last year where he became the head coach. And obviously that's been Axelina's breakout year where she won nationals. She's been to a bunch of you know these big competitions where you know she became one of the most feared athletes in the entire, I'm so serious, in the entire NCAA when it comes to shot put. And so Axelina, I got to ask, what what do you think has helped you in your training? What do you think you know has gotten you these school records? And it seems as though you've only been you know improving more and more and more. And I think what what's your all-time collegiate mark? I think like you're like literally within like the top three or top two, right? Yeah, uh, I threw 1954 this summer, uh, which I think is the second best mark by all times outdoors. Um, so yeah, but last year, like you said, I had a breakthrough year. It was my second year here in Nebraska. And uh, I think I did so well just because I had like a pretty go good good um, build up like last the fall of 2022. I didn't have many breaks like I could train very train very good and um, I also was closer to Justin. We got along very well and just get to know him and the way he's coaching and just also that I'm more comfortable here like I have my friends and I you know I don't have to stress about anything like I'm it's just my normal life now right yeah so I think that's fine <laughs> <laughs> no very smooth yeah I mean I feel the same exact way too and you know when when you came here as a freshman everything seems so weird and so different and then you know as you got more and more comfortable it seems like you can already tell the future you know you know what to eat you know how to train you have a better relationship with your coaches so yeah coach St. Clair I mean he's done an amazing job with you but not only you with you know all the throwers I mean I'm pretty sure Week after week, we're always, you know, ranked within the top one or two in the nation, just as a group, men and women. And so you, you guys are held to a very high standard. And, you know, this is a throws university, in my opinion. I mean, in the outdoor championships, for the men at least, we, I mean, there was like 50 or 60, maybe even 80 points in the field events. I mean, they absolutely killed it. And obviously you killed it outside as well. And so uh, something else I would like to get into about is, you know, what is your hardest, you know, triumph or what is the most difficult part about your day, you know, your, your day to day? I mean, like, as I mentioned before, you're a national champion. You've accomplished so many things here. So for you, what's the hardest part about your day to day? You know, is it, you know, being sore after workouts? Is it going to classes? Is it just, you know, stressing about life? What's, what's probably the hardest thing for you to, you know, in here in college? I would say just to manage school and recovery from the practice. Um, I mean, we practice a lot right now. We're lifting four times a week, throwing four times a week, and you're always tired and like sore from practice. So when you come home, you're not very excited to studying, <laughs> uh, but you have to. So I would say that's the that's the hardest part. Hardest part. Yeah. 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 You and so many other athletes, I mean, it's, it's a very vigorous training cycle. I mean, like you mentioned before, four times a week. And then, as I already said, you guys are one of the best teams in the nation just, you know, as a group. So you guys are training as one of the best teams in the group. You're, you're getting after it. You have one of the best coaches. And whenever you're going anywhere, Coach St. Clair, almost every single thrower or even track athlete knows who Coach St. Clair is. I mean, he won the, the Big Ten track, track Coach of the Year. He won, I think, the Midwest Track Coach of the Year. And so as you, you guys go hand in hand. I mean, you guys are you know both amazing at your craft. So, Axelina, you did mention before that your career is in graphic design. Can you go ahead and tell the people what got you inspired to do that? Why graphic design? You know, what is it? And where do you plan to take it in the future? Uh, so I, I, I'm I'm very creative as a person, and I'm not really good at math and like reading and stuff like that. So I just thought like um, drawing and creating stuff was a better fit for me. So that's basically why I did it. And I also have a friend back home that that does it, and uh, th it just inspired me to try it. And I really like it, so I'm happy that I choose it. Yeah. And so with graphic design too, I mean, graphic design, they're, they're in very high demand. I mean, you guys obviously know advertisements and you see all like the real cool posters and advertisements on the internet. And so, you know, what do you plan to do with it in the future? Is, like there, is, a, is there a specific career, to, a specific company you want to do? You know, how, how does that work? So uh, first you start off with 
working in like a bureau mm -hmm. uh, and you basically do everything and from that you can like have your own company and freelance and do stuff like mm -hmm. that so i think that's kind of what i want to do right. And uh, I really like to create uh, identities for companies. Um, and yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's super dope. That's super dope. Yeah. Um, fun fact, actually, I remember reading up about this. And, you know, when Nike was created back in like the 70s or whenever that was, uh, the girl, it was like a college student that ended up making it for Nike. And Nike was like mm -hmm. nobody at the time. So she made this logo for like probably like 200 or $300. And so she makes this logo and then it ends up blowing up like, you know, like five or 10 years down the road. And then Nike ended up giving her like, like, I think like 5% shares of the company, which is worth like yeah. over like 200, like, you know, 200 to 100 million dollars yeah. just for creating the logo. So maybe that's in your future. Maybe you can create the next type, type of Nike. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> That'd be cool. So actually, can you go ahead and tell us, you know, the cultural difference or more or less the cultural shock when you came to the United States? Like, how was it? Were you nervous or have you already been to the United States before you came here your freshman year? Yeah, the culture shock was very, very <laughs> big. Um, back home in Sweden, where I'm from, uh, the people is very like introverted mm -hmm. and um, yeah, just more to themselves. Uh, don't really talk to strangers and stuff like that. So when I got here, uh, I just noticed like the first day I got here, I, I wore a skirt and then uh, just a random lady comes up to me and was like, hey, I like your skirt. And I was like, <laughs> Oh, thanks. Oh, really? <laughs> I don't know. It's super, it's super friendly and nice, but I was just not used to it. Right. Uh, so just stuff like that. And like people is talking to each other in the elevators and like on the bus and stuff like that. That does not happen at home. <laughs> um, and also Swedish is my native language. So just getting used to the English language was very, very hard. Um, I've listened to like a lot of English um, YouTube videos before I got here. So like I was pretty good to understand what uh, everyone was saying, but it was just hard to speak, speak it because I didn't, I haven't practiced that that much. Uh, and also it was a little bit hard with like, everyone have different accents. Right. So like people from the South, like I have still hard <laughs> to understand what they're saying, um, but it's getting better, yeah. Yeah, no doubt. I remember a, a super funny memory. I don't know what just made me thought about this, but I remember uh, uh, Mikael, your roommate from freshman year, she posted a video of you on Snapchat, a private story, and then you were like so confused. You were like, why is the toilet flushing itself? Oh, <laughs> do you guys not have yes. that down in Switzerland? Like, do the toilets not do that? Yes. No. So <laughs> you have to flush it by yourself, basically. <laughs> and like, or if we have automatically flushing, <laughs> it's kind of like higher up. So you have to like get off the toilet for it to flush. Right. While here, if you just lean forward, it's <laughs> flushing. And I was like, what is going on? <laughs> what about the, the food portion sizes? They're also s way smaller. Really? Like back home, I was never going to restaurants to eat because I never got full. Uh -huh. But here they are huge. So <laughs> I actually enjoy going out and eat on restaurants. Right. Yeah. That's insane. Yeah, I didn't even consider that. So you did mention before that it was hard for you to learn the language. I think before the podcast, you mentioned that you did start learning around the age of seven. And you said that the people people from the South are, are harder to understand. What do you think has helped you the, you know, the absolute most just besides the YouTube videos? Was it communicating with people? Was it, you know, did you have to sit down and like write out a bunch of English words? I mean, what's the, the hardest part between your, your language and then the English language? Do you mean like before I got here or like just to just, just to learn the language? Just to learn the language. I mean, like what did it take? Yeah, basically just to live here, I would say. Like, really? no one here speaks Swedish mm -hmm. when I got here. But now we have Hilvi on the team that's also <laughs> Swedish. But uh, when I got here, I was the only one speaking Swedish. And so no one understood what I was saying. So I like, was forced to speak English. Right. And um, I had I have really good friends that correct me from saying wrong, like gram gram grammatically. Yeah, grammatically. Um, and stuff like that. So... Yeah, I would just say just living in, the, in an environment where you hear English all the time, you speak all the time, and yeah. You're fully immersing yourself in the language. Yeah, for sure. For yeah. sure. <laughs> so actually, no, you're killing this podcast, by the way. I know you're nervous to do this, but you're absolutely <laughs> killing this. So something I really want get, to get into. So obviously, I mentioned before, you're a Big Ten champion, and you're also a national champion. Like, how does that, how does that feel coming from a different country and just absolutely just, you know, killing the field? Um, you know, what does it feel like to be a national champion? I mean, do... Like what did it, what do you think it took? Oh no, it it's cool. I <laughs> um, I don't know. Like 
I think maybe I not really like fully understand like how huge it is mm-hmm. because I'm like yeah it's it's cool you know like I don't really <laughs> think that much about it. Right. Um, but yeah, the the comp- competition here is like so good. Like it's so many girls are throwing so far, and um, you have really to perform on your your best to become a national champ. And uh, I'm just really happy that I managed to do that that day. Um, so yeah, I'm just proud of myself and think it's cool. <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah, you're a very humble athlete. I just got to say. I mean, um, um, you know, coming from a different country, like just meeting you, different people have different cultural differences. But even from when I first met you too, you've always been a real, really nice person, a real personable person. I do. You did say that you were an introvert, but then I feel like when I first met you, like you were super friendly. It was super easy yeah. to talk to. It's never been like I'm nervous to talk to Axelina. Like <laughs> a bunch of people come up to me and they're like, "Oh my gosh, Axelina! Like she's an absolute dog." And I was like, "Oh, Axelina! Like me and her, I, I was just eating with her the other day at yeah. training table. Like she's super cool." So this last kind of part of this podcast I want to get into is future plans and future goals. So uh, I'm gonna put out like a little like hypothetical situation um if you got offered a pro contract today like a like a really good pro contract that that pays you financially from here on out would you take that contract or would you wait to pursue and finish your degree here in college no i would wait you would wait Why? yeah because i get a degree mm-hmm. and uh, i um, i don't really need the money right now because i have a full scholarship i get everything paid for so I'm I'm very happy with my situation and I can still have like sponsorship like I'm uh, I'm about to sign with a Swedish clothing brand right now really? and um, I have some other things going on so I still can get money like but I just have to promote the stuff when I'm back home I just right. can't do anything while I'm here in the states Oh because of NIL right Yeah because NIL oh. um but no, I, w- I would continue my degree. Continue. Yeah. Very smart, very smart. And so as far as your goals, what are do you, would you feel comfortable with sharing your your kind of long-term goals with the with the sporting track and field? Um yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk about it. Uh I mean, I want to throw 21 meters when I'm done. Like I want to yeah, that would be that would be really cool. And I think I can do it because I still have a lot of things to develop both technically but specific like strength like i'm not very strong compared to other girls that's throwing the shot put um so i can definitely improve that and uh, yeah i don't know next year it's the olympic year i want to do well there and we also have an european championship um i want to take a medal i can say that i want to (laughs) take a medal at the european championship um so yeah that's kind of what's coming up now uh, I don't really think about like further in the future. Right. Uh, I take it year after year, you know. But uh, yeah, I would say that's my that's my goals. Goal. Very well put together goals. And so, as far as you know, when it comes to planning and you know all all the success you had, uh, a superstitious superstitious is where you wear like a, a certain pair of socks in the day of your competition, or you eat something very specific before you listen to your favorite song. Do you have any superstition before you throw? I'm trying to not get <laughs> stuff like that, that right. uh, because a coach uh, just told me once that, like, imagine if you're going to another country and they don't have that energy drink that you always drink or they don't have that type of food, you know, then you're going to be like, oh, no, I haven't eaten that. I can't perform, you know. Right, you so know. I'm trying to, yeah, not have anything like that, that I, yeah. Can, I'm just trying to have things that I can control. Like, I like to listen to music when I warm up that hypes me up, and uh, also like to do the makeup, my makeup in the morning, and uh, hype me up to music, you know, stuff like that. Yeah. Um, yeah, just basic stuff, basically. Yeah, yeah, makes sense. That is a very good point because you know, as you're traveling so much all throughout the world, yeah. if you do forget, forget, you know, those favorite pair of socks, or as you mentioned before, the energy drink. What happens? You get in your head, you start overthinking it. So yeah, that's a very good point. And so something I kind of want to close this podcast out with is if you had any advice for you know any girls watching this who want to be in the same position you are, what would you tell them when it comes to training, when it comes to setting goals, when it comes to just being where, where you are today? You know, What advice would you have for somebody out there? This is maybe like a mainstream answer, but like <laughs> work hard. Um, if you are in a training group where you're the best, like you kind of have to push yourself 
and uh, always try to challenge yourself because you can achieve way like much more than what you think you can. Like for this, for example, in the gym the other day, like I was feeling not good at all. Like I felt so weak. And um, last week I did like eighty. I think I did like eighty-five kilos or something like that in incline. And uh, last week I put on 65 kilos and I was like, this is so heavy. This is so <laughs> heavy. Like I, I cannot go higher. But then I was like, okay, I want to throw really far next year. Like I got to push myself. So I put on 68, 70, 72, 75. And I managed to take 75. So I took like 10 kilos more, like 20 pounds more than what I thought mm -hmm. I would have done. So you kind of have to push yourself the whole time and enjoy what you're doing. And... Um, yeah, it's really important that you think it's fun what you're doing because you're gonna do it for a long time. And um, also don't listen to what everyone else says, just do your own thing. If you believe you can do something, then you can do it. Beautiful. That wasn't, main, <laughs> that wasn't mainstream at all. That was so unique. That was like, I feel like that was an actually an answer. That was not mainstream. What are you talking about? But actually, no, thank you so much for doing this podcast. You've absolutely killed it. And like I said, for any girls out there who want to become uh, a track and field athlete, like a thrower like Axelina, listen to her, follow what she does, watch her videos. You can watch them anywhere for, you know, look up national champion Axelina. You'll be able to find on YouTube the way she throws and everything like that. And so if you want to be the best, you got to mimic the best. That's that's what the people say. So Axelina, thanks again for doing this podcast. This is the Nico and I podcast, everybody. Thank you so much for watching. We're out of here. Bye. If you came across someone struggling with hunger, how would you recognize them? By their clothes, their age, the way they speak? Would you notice a 16 year old boy, boy who, who got, got his, his first, first job, job, not for extra spending money, but to help feed his little sisters? Or a mother who's in between jobs and sometimes goes to bed hungry so her kids can have dinner? Or a 14 year old girl who signs up to every after school activity, not to make friends, but just to get something to eat? or a retiree who fell ill and had to choose between getting medicine or groceries. I am the one in eight Americans who struggle with hunger. People you pass by every day but never knew were hungry. I am hungered in America. Hunger can be hard to recognize. Learn why at IamHungerInAmerica.org. Brought to you by Feeding America, 200 Food Bank Strong, and the Ad Council. Start your Sundays off right with Jeff and Nicole Essink on Fitness Fanatics. Jeff and Nicole discuss health and wellness, how to achieve fitness goals, and more through the life of gym owners and gym goers. It's Fitness Fanatics from 9 to 11 a.m. on Sundays on 93.7 The Ticket and theticketfm.com. Lance, you are the best. What about those round trips, which are perfect on your way there and perfect on your way back? Or those meetings with friends, surprise parties, camps, birthdays. The same way you plan for the important moments, start planning to protect you and your loved ones from a natural disaster. Sign up for local weather and emergency alerts. Prepare an emergency kit and make a family communications plan. Get started at ready.gov slash plan. Brought to you by FEMA and the Ad Council. This is your captain. We are going to be experiencing some slight turbulence. Please fasten your... Oh, hold on. Just got a video of my cat. Imagine the pilot of an airplane was as confident as you are texting and driving. Seems kind of crazy when you put it like that. Visit StopTextStopRex.org, a message brought to you by the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, Project Yellow Light, and the Ad Council. I think it's just vapor. Vaping is safer than smoking, isn't it? There's really not even that much nicotine in them, right? One vape pod has as much nicotine as one pack of cigarettes. My kid? My kid knows it's dangerous. 5.4 million American kids vape, and most think it's harmless. Get your head out of the cloud. Talk to your kid about vaping. Visit talkaboutvaping.org. That's talkaboutvaping.org. Brought to you by the American Lung Association and the Ad Council. If you came across someone struggling with hunger, how would you recognize them? By their clothes. Their age. The way they speak. Hunger can be hard to recognize. Learn why at IamHungerInAmerica.org. Brought to you by Feeding America, 200 Food Bank Strong, and the Ad Council. So what's this new concept happening at 1040 O Street? There's 93.7 The Ticket, there's The Mill Coffee and Tea, and there's Grandma's Bake Shop and Beatrice Bakery? Well, yeah, it's all of those things. It's a place for the community to hang out, grab a drink and a bite, and just chill. Or work. Or meet. Or chat. Or whatever you want to do. 
93.7 The Ticket, The Mill Coffee and Tea, Grandma's Bake Shop, and Beatrice Bakery. All together at 1040 O Street. Dance like a dad. It's a great way to make a moment with your kids. First, I hold my hands out like they're on a steering wheel. Then I look over my shoulder. Next, oh, I put it in reverse. Me, me, me. Visit fatherhood.gov. Brought to you by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services and the Ad Council. One in three adults has pre-diabetes. One in three. That means it could be you, your football buddy, your football buddy, or you, your best man, your worst man, you, your dog walker, your cat jogger. While one in three adults has pre-diabetes, with early diagnosis, pre-diabetes can be reversed. Take the risk test at doihaveprediabetes.org. That's doihaveprediabetes.org. Wait, did they just say one in three adults has pre-diabetes? That's 33.33333% of adults. That means it could be me, my boss, or my boss's boss, or me, my favorite sister, or my other sister. That's seven members of my 21-person romantic book club. <gasps> Wait, the one in three could be me, my karaoke partner, Carol, or ugh, my karaoke enemy, Jeff. I'm going to take the risk test at doihaveprediabetes.org. Brought to you by the Ad Council and its pre-diabetes awareness partners. Are you working in or looking to get into the electrical construction industry? The electrical workers of Local Union 265 are now hiring licensed journeymen and apprentices and are offering great pay and benefits. Call Mike at 402-875-1034 to apply. Start your electrical career today. Back to the Ticket Weeknights on 93.7 The Ticket and theticketfm.com. All right, guys, so we have just finalized those two little podcasts. And as I mentioned before, I mean, both are just two amazing athletes here at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. One is a gymnastics athlete and the other is a shot putting athlete that is from another country. And so that just goes to show, you know, the type of athletes and the type of standards that are held at the university. I mean, this all in all honesty is the best decision I made to, to come to this university. I mean, not only have I grown as an athlete, but I've also grown so much as a person even being able to have this opportunity here at this at this radio station to you know enhance my speaking spill my speaking skills enhance my network of people that I know on a day-to-day basis I mean it's just been truly amazing but the University of Nebraska I mean they utilize so much just upon like building your career and building the person that you want to be in the future and this is going to be something I'm able to look back on you know 20 30 40 even 50 years into the future and say like you know feel proud and have us the pride to you know come from a university like this so you know, even though we're all different athletes and we're all, you know, so unique in our different ways, as I mentioned before, there's, you know, foreign athletes, there's athletes that come from this university, me, or come from the state, me, I came from Illinois, uh, it was a culture shock when I first got here, but it was a culture shock in, in the right way, you know, it's, it forced me to get outside of my comfort zone, you know, early on, I was very, I was kind of introverted in my own way, you know, I was kind of like locked myself away, I mean, I was a very talkative person once I was comfortable, but I mean, th- being here has forced me to get outside, and so this is just all, all in all been great. Um, and as for what's coming next for any of my listeners out there who are having kind of a long drive, we have the new swimmers and divers episode uh, called Drip or Drown. One athlete, her name is Frankie. She is from Switzerland. And then Abby, she is from Texas. And so they are both divers here at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. If you guys ever are interested in you know, checking out a swim meet, um, they, are comp- they are in season now. They are in the full swing of things and their season ends around February. So if you haven't yet to been to a swimmer dives me go ahead and check that out but as i mentioned before this has been the nico at night podcast here live every single two to three on sundays so go ahead and check us out on instagram at 93.7 the ticket and this has been nico schultz from the university of nebraska lincoln track team see you guys